in the Committee of the Whole. Under the rule, the previous question is ordered. Is there a separate vote demanded on any amendment to the amendment the nature of substitute reported from the Committee of the Whole? If not, the question is on adoption of the amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question is on engrossment and third reading of the bill. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed will say no. The ayes have it. Third reading. A bill to improve the consideration by the Securities and Exchange Commission of the costs and benefits of its regulations and orders. The House will be in order. Members are asked to please take their conversations from the floor. Members and their staff will please take their seats. The chair would ask that members would please take their conversations from the floor. Those members remaining in the chamber would please take their seats. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California rise? Mr. Speaker, I have a motion to recommit at the desk. Is the gentlewoman opposed to the bill? In its current form, I am. The gentlewoman qualifies. The clerk will report the motion. Ms. Waters of California moves to recommit the bill, H.R. 1062, to the Committee on Financial Services with instructions to report the same back to the House forthwith with the following Mr. Amendment. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent. Consider it as read. Jump from New Jersey seeks recognition. Dispense with the reading. Is there objection to dispensing with the reading? Seeing none. Pursuant to the rule, the gentlewoman from California is recognized for five minutes in support of the motion. The gentlelady will suspend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. This is the final amendment to the bill which would not kill the bill or send it back to committee. If adopted, the bill will immediately proceed to final passage as amended. This motion ensures the ability of the SEC to continue to protect investors and enforce the securities laws. I want to emphasize that this motion does not stop the bill, but it does flag the very important ways in which we need to let the SEC act. The motion would ensure that the SEC can protect investors and enforce the securities laws in two specific areas. First, the motion will ensure that this bill does not reduce the ability of the SEC to protect the pension plans of our firefighters and police and the people on whom we rely as our first responders, as well as the pension plans of teachers and other retirees against fraudulent and deceptive practices. Protecting investors is a core element of the SEC's mission and one that we ignore at our peril. This bill is, this week rather, is police officers week. Do we really want to honor our men and women in service by stripping them of protections for their hard earned one earnings? This the gentlelady order. from California deserves to be heard. Mr. Speaker, continue. these protections become ever more crucial as we rely increasingly on the securities markets for our retirement savings. Second, the motion to recommit focuses on protecting investors by ensuring that the SEC can protect against the takeover of American firms by foreign companies, particularly Chinese companies, that are using such mergers to access the investor funds in our capital markets without going through the SEC registration process. The SEC has had numerous enforcement actions against such companies, which purchase a small company and merge it with a larger, often fraudulent foreign company. It has worked hard to protect the savings of hard-working Americans, including union pension holders and other pensioners, from being disadvantaged by these Chinese firms that don't play by the same rules. 
Both of these areas highlight the importance of SEC action to protect investors, particularly those preparing for retirement. With Americans increasingly dependent on the securities markets to protect their retirement savings, it is more critical than ever to ensure that we preserve the ability of the SEC to act. Just yesterday, we heard from the SEC's new chairwoman, Mary Jo White. When we asked her about this bill, she said that she found it very troubling. I don't imagine that a former prosecutor who took on the mob and terrorists is easily troubled. Indeed, she said that she had already needed at least 45 new economists to meet the need for an expanded economic analysis under the SEC standards, but she couldn't hire them due to the sequester. This is troubling indeed. Rather than helping the SEC to do its job better, we're cutting its budget and throwing up new roadblocks like this bill. It is a mistake, and I urge my colleagues to support this motion and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? So I rise in opposition. The gentleman's yeah. recognized for five minutes. And Mr. Speaker, I will be brief. <laughs> and I will simply address both the process and the policy briefly. On the process, I appreciate the gentlelady bringing this amendment here to the floor today. But as she knows, we were in committee for multiple hours hearing various amendments on the underlying legislation. And she had every opportunity to bring it before the entire committee at that time, and we could have had a full and complete debate and an actual vote in the committee at that time. I had lost for a reason why she did not go through the regular order. But more specifically to the, the merits of the underlying bill and the amendment. If there could be anything simpler or easier than what we're trying to do in the underlying bill, H.R. 1062. Mr. Speaker, now well, let the people go. Mr. Speaker, all we're asking the SEC to do is this. Identify a problem first before you do a regulation. And then once you consider a regulation, consider all the alternatives that are out there, not just the initial one that comes forward. And then once you pass that regulation, the next year and years after that, go back and reconsider them and make sure that they're being done effectively and they were the most efficient regulations for the economy. That's the underlying legislation. That's why I encourage my members to support the underlying bill. To the MTR, what is the SEC in charge to do? Three basically core commission, pr pr provisions, investor protection, capital formation, and efficient markets. And perhaps to the point here, one of the most important, investor protection. Who are we talking about when we're talking about investors? It's that single mom out there who's trying to raise a young girl and try to put her into college and have money to do so. It's the young couple who wants to have financing and be able to buy their first home. It's our moms and dads and our grandparents, the pensioners, the retirees, to want to know that their investments are secure and the markets are operating efficiently. And to the point here with your amendment, most specifically, yes, it's the cop on the beat, it's the fireman, it's the union worker who, is who wants to make sure that he's investing his time and efforts into our community and his investments are most taken care of in efficient operation on the markets on Wall Street and the markets as well. That's what our bill does. All of them are taken care of in the underlying legislation. Your amendment basically says we don't care as far as making sure the most efficient rules are concerned when it comes to the firefighters, the pensioners, or the teachers. I'll close on, I'll close on this. I know how to get it. If we want to honor the firefighters, if we want to honor the police officers, if we want to honor the teachers and the pension funds, vote no on this MTR and vote yes on the final passage. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Without objection, the previous question is ordered on the motion to recommit. The question is on the motion. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed will say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The motion is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I request a recorded vote. The gentlelady from California requests a recorded vote. Those in favor of recording vote will rise. A sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members record their vote by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 9 of Rule 20, this five-minute vote on the motion to recommit will be followed by a five-minute vote on passage of the final bill. If ordered, this is a five-minute vote. 
the House now voting on a motion to recommit, a procedure attempted to change a bill before final passage, sending it back to committee. Again, the bill members are voting on would require the Securities and Exchange Commission to conduct a cost-benefit analysis before issuing new regulations. A vote on final passage is expected next, as you heard. President Obama is just up I-95 in Baltimore at a dredge manufacturing company in Baltimore, Maryland. He'll meet with company representatives and employees and then deliver remarks on jobs in the economy. That'll happen at about 1.20, just a couple of minutes from now. Later, the president will visit a community center. We're planning live coverage of the president's remarks on C-SPAN 2. And again, that is expected at 1.20 Eastern. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel and the chair of the Joint Chiefs, General Martin Dempsey, will be talking with reporters at 2.30. He'll be at the Pentagon. Yesterday, they were at the White House for high-level talks about the issue of sexual assaults in the military. We are expecting questions on that and possibly the situation in Syria. You can see live coverage of that also on C-SPAN 2 this afternoon. And again, that'll be at 2.30 Eastern.
On this vote, the yeas are 179, the nays are 217. The motion is not adopted. The question is on final passage. Those in favor will say aye. All those opposed will say no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Uh, Mr. Speaker, speaker I ask for General a recorded lady, vote. General from California requests a recorded vote. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This will be a five-minute vote. So final passage now on this bill requiring the Securities and Exchange Commission to conduct a cost-benefit analysis before issuing new regulations. This is the last bit of legislative business the House will conduct this week. You can see live coverage of the House when members return next week here on C-SPAN. The Senate is not in session today. Lawmakers will reconvene at 2 p.m. Eastern Monday. The work on the Farm Bill will be a number of judicial nominations they will also debate. Live coverage of the Senate when lawmakers return on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. President Obama right now at a dredge manufacturing company in Baltimore, Maryland. He's meeting with company representatives and employees today. But right now, the president's making remarks on jobs in the economy. We have it live on our companion network, C-SPAN 2, right now. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel and the chair of the Joint Chiefs will uh, talk with reporters at 2.30 at the Pentagon. Yesterday, they were at the White House discussing the issue of sexual assault in the military. We do expect questions about that and Syria. Live coverage will be this afternoon on C-SPAN 2. Again, that will start at 2.30 Eastern. Also this, the president will present singer-songwriter Carol King with the Gershwin Prize for Popular Song from the Library of Congress next week. She's the first woman to receive the award. The White House says the ceremony will happen Wednesday during a concert featuring Carol King, Gloria Estefan, Billy Joel, Jesse McCartney, Emily Sande, James Taylor, and Trisha Yearwood.
On this vote, the yeas are 235 and the nays are 161. The bill is passed. Without objection, motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns to meet on Monday next, when it shall convene at noon for morning hour debate and 2 p.m. for legislative business. Objection. The chair will now entertain requests for one-minute speeches. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Florida seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I rise this afternoon to honor Juan Manuel Salvat, owner of Miami's first Spanish-language bookseller, Libreria Universal, which will sadly be closing after his retirement in June. Having fled Castro's totalitarian grip, Juan Manuel was eager to rescue the essential works of the Cuban culture. He sought to tell the story of the Cuban exile experience, and that is how, in 1965, he founded Universal Publishing and its subsidiary, Universal Bookseller and Distributor. Since then, this company has been dedicated to the distribution and publication of books from Hispanic and Cuban authors, including my father, Enrique Ross. I thank Salvat for playing a major role in illustrating the road traveled by our Cuban exile community through the more than 1,600 published titles while giving readers a deeper understanding of Cuban and Latin America's culture, history, politics, and literature. We will miss this great cultural leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? For one minute and to revise and extend. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I implore my colleagues to address the global climate process. A recent academic study found that 97 percent of scientists agree that human activity is mainly responsible for climate change. That same study concluded that the public has been misled into thinking that uh, there's a, a difference in thinking between uh, scientists on this. but. 97% of scientists agree that this is a problem. How much longer will science deniers and their supporters in Congress spread misinformation about the facts and the dangers of climate change? The fact that we are now, we have more carbon dioxide in our uh, atmosphere than at any time in the past three million years. As a member of the Safe Climate Caucus, I urge all of my colleagues to recognize the dangers of climate change and to come together and address this problem uh, ASAP. We don't have much time to uh, lose. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. 
I have the pleasure of rising today to congratulate no Low Country native and St. Helena Island's own Candace Glover on winning the title of American Idol. She's the daughter of John and Carol Glover, and Candace is a graduate of Buford High School. And I think that uh, her story ultimately is inspirational because what she does is she teaches and reminds every one of us on the importance of this simple notion of trying, trying, and trying yet again, because it was in fact on her third attempt that she actually made it, and it made all the difference. I was there for a hero's welcome just a couple of weeks ago in Buford, South Carolina, and I can only imagine the welcome that she will now receive. She was then one of three. She won it this week. Her career is one that started at Oaks True Holiness Church back home at the age of four, wherein she was singing literally to the Lord, it was only the beginning, and as South Carolina's new congressman from the 1st Congressional District, I speak for many who could not be more proud of Canis for indeed the way that she reminds every one of us of the importance of trying, trying, and trying yet again. Congratulations, Candace. I yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to share my grave concern about the Keystone XL pipeline at H.R. 3, the Northern Route Approval Act, which unfortunately uh, passed through committee this past week. It will allow accelerating building of this pipeline and give certain advantages to a foreign country, Canada, against our citizens that otherwise would have rights to go to court, which are being deprived. The world's foremost climatologist, former NASA scientist Dr. James Hansen, was one of the first scientists to warn of the dangers of burning carbon fuel. And he's likened the, likened the building and the use of the Keystone XL pipeline to the lighting of the fuse to the biggest carbon bomb on the planet, and nothing less. Dr. Hansen warned that the completion of the Keystone XL pipeline will only reinforce our dependence on fossil oils, not strengthen our nation's energy independence, which has been argued by some on the other side. By furthering our dependence on fossil fuels, we only push our Earth farther and farther from the point of no return. Just last week, the highest rating of carbon in our in our atmosphere ever was recorded in Hawaii, 400 points. This portends even a hotter summer than the hottest summers we've ever faced on this planet. Building a pipeline that carries the dirtiest of oils, tar sands from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico on their way to China is exactly the opposite of addressing climate change in America. So next week I urge my colleagues to vote no on H.R. 3 in the interest of preserving our earth for generations to come. I yield back the balance of my time. What purpose does the gentleman from for, um, Pennsylvania seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, for too long, Congress has kicked the can down the road and avoided putting forward a long-term plan for college affordability. Yesterday, the House Education Committee took a strong step forward by strengthening our student loan programs and passing H.R. 1911, the Smarter Solutions for Students Act. Absent congressional action, interest rates on student loans will double from 3.4 to 6.8 percent on July 1st. This bill prevents this from happening and ends what has become an annual debate within Congress on how to set the rates for student loans, a process that has served neither the students nor the taxpayers. H.R. 1911 builds on a proposal put forward by President Obama in his fiscal year 2014 budget request, which would move to a market-based interest rate. The bill would allow students to take advantage of low interest rates, but also protect them with reasonable rate caps during higher rate environments. Mr. Speaker, I encourage my colleagues to join in support of this bill, which will offer students the lowest possible cost for higher education and ensure the solvency of these important programs. And I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Florida seek recognition? Without objection, the lady is recognized for one minute. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. I rise to uh, place in the congressional record the names of six phenomenal women who have positively influenced the lives of the people of my hometown, West Palm Beach, Florida. Sherry Brooks, Renee Kessler, and Eileen Silber, dynamic educators who have devoted their lives to the future of the youth of our community. Sherry Hyman, an exceptional lawyer who has helped shape our county's physical environment. Mona Reese, a courageous crusader for women's health and re reproductive rights. And Young Song, 
a brilliant architect whose projects bring joy to thousands of visitors each year. Best yet, these phenomenal women have beautiful hearts and remarkable children. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and provide you with 10 minutes. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor Lenore Chief uh, Ken Briscoe, the Fire Chief, and, and his term of President for North Carolina Association of Fire Chiefs comes to an end this August. It's a well-earned rest after serving seven years and traveling across the state of North Carolina and the United States representing more than 1,500 fire chiefs and 45,000 firefighters in North Carolina. Chief Briscoe has been the fire chief for the city of Lenore since 2004 and has worked in the fire service for over 35 years. During that time, his main focus has been improving training and education for firefighters in North Carolina. Chief Briscoe will continue to serve on the board of directors as a past president of the North Carolina Association of Fire Chiefs. And today, we honor his years of service and express our appreciation for his continued commitment to North Carolina firefighters. We're grateful to Chief Briscoe and to his fellow firefighters across North Carolina for their bravery and selfless dedication to protecting our communities in the face of danger. I yield back, Mr. Speaker. For what purpose is it? Oh, sorry. For what purpose does the gentlelady from New Mexico seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, instead of taking steps to create jobs and grow the economy, Republicans yesterday voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act for the 37th time. The Affordable Care Act is working and its benefits are being felt throughout the country, especially in my home state. Almost 525,000 New Mexicans now have access to free preventative services such as mammograms, flu shots, and colonoscopy screenings. Almost 19,000 seniors have benefited from lower prescription drugs, and over 26,000 young adults in New Mexico can stay on their parents' insurance plans until they're 26. So why in the world would we want to hurt seniors, women, and young people by repealing the Affordable Care Act? And let's not forget, the Affordable Care Act is a job creator. The Medicaid expansion alone will create six to 8,000 jobs in New Mexico and pump more than $5 billion into our economy over the next six years. Mr. Speaker, let's stop trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act and let's get back to work on behalf of the American people. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I stand before you today to address a mounting health crisis. On behalf of nearly 26 million Americans and 532,000 Kentuckians who suffer from diabetes, this disease kills more Americans each year than breast cancer and AIDS combined and costs our nation more than $200 billion in health care expenses each year. Tragically, every 17 seconds, someone is diagnosed with diabetes, and current estimates project that by 2050, as many as one in three Americans will suffer from diabetes. We cannot sit idly by and accept the likelihood of this bleak future. Diabetes can be devastating, but it can be managed. Like most chronic diseases, diabetes can be attributed to poor behaviors, such as lack of physical activity, poor nutritional choices, and, and other uh, uh, risky behaviors. By not only changing our behaviors, but improving access to education, proper diabetes care, and continued funding for research to find a cure, we can truly make a positive, sustained change in the quality of life for millions of Americans. The chair lays before the House the following personal requests. Leaves of absence requested for Mr. Cummings of Maryland for today, Mrs. Kirkpatrick of Arizona for today, and Mr. John Lewis of Georgia for today. Without objection, the requests are granted.
Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3, 2013, the gentlewoman from District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Minority Leader. I thank you, I thank you Mr. Speaker. I, I, I come to the floor uh, to discuss a bill addressed only to my district, the District of Columbia, which will uh, come to a hearing in the Judiciary Subcommittee chaired by uh, Chairman uh, Trent Franks of the Subcommittee on the Constitution next Thursday. But in point of fact, over the last month there have been two such bills introduced in this House, bills that can only fairly be characterized as abuse of power they are both directed against only one jurisdiction, uh, the, my own uh, district. One would appear to be a federal matter. Uh, that bill would make permanent the Hyde Amendment, which annually uh, passes this House every year, uh, barring the use of federal funds for abortion. Wherever you stand on abortion, at the very least, that is a federal matter. In the very same bill uh, is an outrageous abuse. The bill seeks to do the same for the District of Columbia, barring permanently the use of local funds, funds raised by local taxpayers, uh, for abortions for low-income women. Local funds are similarly used in districts across the United States because, after all, they are local funds. This bill, <laughs> for purposes of the bill, makes D.C. Or, or redefines the nation's capital, which was given home rule in 1973, as a freestanding federal agency for purposes of abortion. <laughs> Imagine having your district defined as a federal agency so that the Congress can make ideolo ideological points by overturning, overturning local legislation uh, at will. Yeah, this is still America. That bill is uh, H.R. Um, 946, and as to the District of Columbia, it's, it, it's, it's simply an expanded way to interfere with a local jurisdiction. Um, I must say that I think that bill and the other bill I will discuss does point to the bankruptcy uh, of uh, the Republican agenda in the 213th Congress, 113th Congress. Um, yeah, and, and this bill essentially does what is done anyway every year with respect uh, to abortion. It hasn't come to the floor yet, and indeed, very few bills have come to the floor. Sometimes the House <laughs> uh, has a rule one day and the bill the next day when there was plenty of time on both days because it doesn't have any agenda and it has to stretch out what few bills it has to make it look like there's something that the House is doing. Well, you know, that's the House's business. Now the House is into my business when it deals with the district I represent, a district of 600,000 American citizens who you can bet your life are going to demand and always demand to be treated as full American citizens because that is exactly what we are. So we will never accept riding over our rights, our local rights and our constitutional rights 
in order to satisfy the agenda of this member of Congress or that member of Congress who is making a point for special interest groups or for, for others. Now the bill that I want to primarily discuss, H.R. 1797, goes beyond the usual way in which the Congress, or at least the Republican Congress, seeks to interfere with the rights of the people of the District of Columbia. What they do generally is to take advantage of the fact that the district's own local taxpayer-raised funds have to come here essentially to be checked off and signed off, and they don't ever look at the budget. How could they? They don't know anything about a local jurisdiction's budget, but they do use it uh, to attach their own ideological stripes, and the usual one has to do with abortion. Well, H.R. 1797 uses the, the District of Columbia in yet a new way and a new, a new abuse because it goes beyond the low-income women whom the district uh, cannot spend its own local funds on abortions for poor women. Instead, H.R. 1797 goes out after every woman in the District of Columbia uh, because that bill essentially would make abortions in the District of Columbia after 20 weeks, uh, illegal. Now, don't talk to me about the constitutional point. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, here is a bill that seeks to regulate uh, pregnancy and abortion, a local matter with respect to only one jurisdiction, and it's a matter that usually involves a matter of principle. People who are uh, pro-life, as they call themselves, have my respect. But this circumstance is the only example where I have seen them try to apply the principle only to one jurisdiction, leaving everybody else in the United States unavailed of the so-called principle. If abortion should be denied after 20 weeks as a matter of principle, then surely that principle should apply throughout the United States. There's a reason why it doesn't, and I will assure you get to that. Um, but first I want to thank Chairman Trent Franks for uh, permitting me the courtesy uh, of testifying next Thursday at the hearing on this bill uh, that affects only my district. Um, th he had two bills last year. This bill is a redux of the same bill that came to the floor and was defeated last year. And he had another to permanently disallow local funds to be used to fund abortions for poor women. On both of those, I was denied the right, the courtesy of testifying, which is traditionally always granted to members, even though bills don't usually involve only one jurisdiction. Now, this bill... Um, is of great concern, not only to me, but there's going to be a press conference uh, next year indicating how the bill is viewed by women all over the United States as, of course, a, a vehicle to get to the reproductive uh, rights of women across the country. It's fatally flawed in at least three obvious ways. First, there is discriminatory treatment of the District of Columbia by banning abortions after 20 weeks only in the District of Columbia. As I've indicated, if that's a principle, it's a principle that anybody would want to apply nationwide. 
but it's not applied nationwide in this bill because the district is the one jurisdiction over which Congress has a modicum of, of control because until the district becomes a state, the Congress can step in. But of course, the Home Rule Act contemplates that in a democracy, they would never step in unless there was an abuse of federal power by the District of Columbia. This is, on the contrary, an abuse of federal, pow of federal power uh, by the Congress of the United States were this to pass. So first it discriminates by picking out the district among all the districts in the United States. Um, secondly, it violates unabashedly Roe versus Wade, which allows abortion until viability as determined by a physician. Uh, Roe and all of its uh, cases, all of the precedents that follow it make it clear that viability cannot be determined by statute. Roe versus Wade uh, 40 years ago guaranteed uh, the right of an abortion as a constitutional right. So you can expect that this is a matter that would be ultimately uh, challenged. But the reason that the district is the vehicle used here is that uh, the special interests obviously want a federal imprimatur and don't have the guts to go get it by bringing a bill to the House floor that would apply to everybody. So they. They choose the bullying way, the easy way. You have a federal imprimatur if you can get the Congress to vote with respect to one jurisdiction uh, because the Congress is federal. And of course, the bill violates the Home Rule Act itself because while the Home Rule Act acknowledges the ultimate jurisdiction of, of the Congress, it clearly in its terms contemplates that uh, the legislative power will go to the Council of the District of Columbia. There's no principled reason here to violate that local sanctity. So here we have gone from the usual attack on low-income women by denying the city uh, its authority to spend its own taxpayer-raised funds as it sees fit to an attack on every woman of childbearing age, every such family in the District of Columbia. And the bill goes further. It criminalizes abortion by uh, making a physician subject to imprisonment for up to two years for abiding by Roe versus Wade and, and engaging in an abortion. And then the bill has a truly bizarre section which gives new meaning to the word extreme. It allows any current or former health provider who has ever treated a woman, and it doesn't say when that provider might have treated a woman perhaps as a child because it has no limit but allows any former health provider uh, to obtain an injunction <laughs> to stop the abortion. The right to privacy is <laughs> left over here. The, the right to an abortion under Roe versus Wade. Uh, this is uh, a new low in ex extreme provisions that we have seen in the Congress from my Republican colleagues. The very idea of even introducing a bill that would deny the constitutional rights of one jurisdiction is an outrage in and of itself. Sure, bills are introduced on this floor all the time that are on their face unconstitutional, but it takes uh, 
uh, a, a great deal of bullying determination uh, to pick out one jurisdiction because you don't have the courage to, pat, to come forward with a national law, a national bill. We do by, by, by no means <laughs> do we believe a, a, uh, a national bill is appropriate. <laughs> this bill has also been introduced on the other side by Senator Mike Lee of Utah. Apparently someone asked him if, if there is a 20-week abortion bill in Utah or if Congress might introduce one for Utah. He was quick to say, no, they don't have such a bill in Utah, and he would oppose it uh, if the Congress tried to enact it in Utah, and he would oppose. He would be for it only if Utah itself enacted the bill. So here we have a Tea Party Republican of the Senate who applies his Tea Party principles until he just doesn't want to. And, and that happens to be when it comes to the District of Columbia. Anybody who thinks we're going to stand up here and let that happen without, in fact, protesting it and rallying Americans who believe in fairness to our cause, they do not know us very well. We will not. We refuse to be a vehicle for the extreme views or pet projects of some Republicans. They have their own outlets. Uh, they have the right to come to this floor and offer bills. They have the right to speak on this floor in any way they choose. We will not be a prop for those views. And these are the supposedly small government Tea Party Republicans who, who are now using the big foot federal government against a lone jurisdiction that doesn't have a vote on this floor, that could not vote for or against it if it came to this floor. What kind of courage is that? It's a bully's path to making ideological points. You want an ideological point? You got an ideological point? Make it. Don't use my district to do so. Particularly, should this be the case for the extreme right-wing part of the Republican Party, who doesn't even want the federal government and what the federal government ought to be doing. So now they've got the federal government in something that even they say the federal government should never be doing, interfering with the local rights of people to govern themselves. Look, this is a country in which there are wide differences about many subjects, perhaps none more so than the right to reproductive choice. But it is also a country that respects one another in the various states and localities where we live and do not try to reach over and somehow compel people in one jurisdiction to do as people in another jurisdiction in fact do. That's the difference between this country, a federal republic, and other countries. And it's a district we, are, we mean to hold this Congress. And it's a principle we mean to hold this Congress to. There's a claim that, well, uh, the district doesn't do enough restricting of abortion. So that's why we simply have to step in here. On the contrary, there are nine states that do not restrict abortions any more than the district does. And the district abides by Roe versus Wade. But this bill is directed against only one jurisdiction. Of course, of course, I take exception uh, to the bill itself, but I take particular exception against being bullied 
by people outside my jurisdiction in order to satisfy their own personal philosophical concerns. I can tell you this much. The notion that you can uh, use the district and abuse its women on reproductive choice and nobody else w will care should have been put to rest last year. The kickoff of the Republican attack on reproductive rights was in fact this bill which went to the floor and failed. But they didn't stop there. Uh, they, they, uh, going back to abortion was not enough. They went all the way back to contraception and amazingly made contraception a campaign matter in the last election. Well, I hope you've learned your lesson because women put all of this together and showed what they thought about it uh, in the presidential election. I am very grateful to women all over the country for how they responded specifically uh, to this very bill, this 20-week abortion bill that applied only to the District of Columbia. They were not fooled for a moment. Women across the United States uh, wrote uh, thousands of emails and letters indicating that they understood this bill, the very same bill that was defeated last year, to be a vehicle for inroads into the reproductive rights of women across the United States. So far from ignoring it, because after all, it's only 600,000 people. They're the ones who live in the District of Columbia. I may live in California. I may live in Wyoming. Who cares? We saw them coming out of the states in large numbers, making it clear that they saw it for what it was, that special interest groups are going from state to state to pass anti-choice bills. They, they, they began at personhood where there is absolutely no, would be no right to an abortion uh, or hardly contraception uh, because in their view, life begins at conception. And then they come up and some have uh, six week bills and, and there are other 20 week bills. They are all over the map. And by the way, uh, they are quite divided because they are all over the map. They've settled on 20-week abortion, however, for this bill, and we mean to do for, for this bill what we did last year, to turn it back, uh, to make women all over the country understand it for what it is, uh, just as they did last year, for them to see that the only way to resist these attacks is to be as persistent uh, as our opponents are in coming back to attack women using the women of the District of Columbia. The women of my district are the chosen vehicle, but the targets are a national campaign against the reproductive rights of women in the nation. Uh, they can't come to the floor, or they won't, with a broadside attack on the reproductive rights of women. So they do the cowardly thing and come uh, against the District of Columbia because of the technical jurisdiction that, of course, uh, I concede the Congress has, but no principled Congress would ever use against the local jurisdiction. So I come to the floor uh, this uh, uh, afternoon <laughs> to put everybody on notice that you can come as many times as you want and as many ways as you want. But I represent 600,000 tax-paying Americans 
and they insist that they are equal to Americans everywhere else. For a hundred years, they did not have any rights. They didn't have the right to vote for president. They didn't have a right for a local government. For a hundred years, uh, they were ruled by three commissioners appointed by the president. During the civil rights era, the, the Congress became ashamed of having a local jurisdiction that was its nation's capital, that did not have the same rights as other people in the United States, not even a local government, a mayor, or a city council who could enact legislation affecting the local population, although this population has been, has been paying federal income taxes ever since uh, our country uh, has been collecting income taxes. And our, our residents have fought and died in every war our country has ever fought, including the war that created the United States of America. When you are American citizens in a jurisdiction as old and historic as the nation's capital is, you, can, you better understand that we will not have our citizenship rights taken away lightly. And we will not be used and abused by members of this Congress, whatever their party. Our union is not perfect, but it strives to be. It can become perfect only when uh, it uh, hears about its imperfections. There is no imperfection greater than having members of Congress focus on one jurisdiction that does not have the same ability to defend itself as every other jurisdiction. It is hard enough to see members of Congress come down and vote on the district's local appropriation, which they had nothing to do with collecting, but which is still a part of, of what is allowed in the Congress. But it is disgraceful to see one issue picked out and one jurisdiction alone the target of that issue. If you feel strongly about your issue, step up and air your issue in the way this House allows. Uh, and I, I ask that whatever the Congress does, that it ask itself when it deals with the District of Columbia, is what we are doing consistent with the principles that we profess on this floor time and again? I ask reconsideration of, of any such attempts in the future, and I must say, that there is no possible way that any self-respecting jurisdiction would accept such treatment. And so, Mr. Speaker, I put the Congress on, on notice. We will never, we do not accept the discriminatory treatment in, in the Franks bill uh, or in the bill uh, that I discussed previously. Uh, to bar abortions in federal uh, legislation permanently, which somehow tucks the district into the same bill. Uh, we do not accept and never will accept second-class treatment by the Congress of the United States. Uh, we will always protest it, and we will always find a way to find the solid ground that American citizens must stand on to protect their rights. I yield back the remainder of my time. 
The gentlelady yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3, 2013, the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my privilege to uh, uh, be recognized to address you here on the floor of the House of Representatives and, uh, and listening to the gentlelady 